Hey, I'm Tamara Kendacker, and you're listening to The Decibel from The Globe and Mail. So on yesterday's episode, we talked about the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the conversation was mostly bleak. But it did end on a hopeful note. And if you haven't already heard it, you should definitely listen because the report really lays out the stakes of what we're facing. Experts believe that one of the consequences of global warming that's already locked in and will get worse unless we stop it will be the mass displacement of people. Rising temperatures mean more frequent extreme weather events like floods and wildfires, which we're already seeing right now, but also things like droughts and rising sea levels, which will slowly push people out of their homes. These people, who are often forced to travel long distances and cross borders due to climate crises, are known as climate refugees. The UN says by 2050, there may be 200 million of them. The thing is, as of right now, there is no official definition for a climate refugee, and they're not protected in the same way that someone would be if they were fleeing their home because of war or persecution based on a protected ground like religion or political opinion. And they can be sent back home. My guest Omar Elakad has been thinking about migration for a long time as both a journalist and a novelist. He was at the Globe for a decade where he covered the war in Afghanistan and the Arab Spring, among other things. His first book, American War, imagines a second civil war in the U.S. triggered partly by climate change. His most recent novel, What Strange Paradise, is set against the backdrop of the revolutions in the Middle East and the migrant crisis that came after, And it follows the story of a refugee child driven from his home. Here's a short excerpt from the audiobook imagining how locals on a Greek island feel about the increasing number of bodies washing up on their shores. These are foreign dead. No one can remember exactly when they first started washing up along the eastern coast. But in the last year, it has happened with such frequency that many of the nations on whose tourists the island's economy depends have issued travel advisories. The hotels and resorts, in turn, have offered discounts. Between them, the Coast Guard and the morgue keep a partial count of the dead. And as of this morning, it stands at 1,026. But this number is as much an abstraction as the dead themselves are to the people who live here, to whom all the shipwrecks of the previous year are a single shipwreck. All the bodies, a single body. In an essay for The Globe, Omar warns that unless we build a framework for climate refugees soon, quote, the defining crisis of the coming decades will play out the way so many prior refugee crises have played out before, first with indifference, then rejection, and finally bloodshed. And I think to me, regardless of where the numbers end up or where the trend lines take us, The one thing that terrifies me more than anything else is how often as a society, when we have a difficult problem, we retreat into violence, into state-sanctioned violence as a solution. I think anything we can do to move away from that inevitability saves lives in the long run. Omar joins me today on The Decibel. Omar, hello. Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. So you live in Oregon and the wildfire season last year got you thinking about how we as a world are going to deal with the refugees created by climate disasters like wildfires. And I wonder if you can talk about how you made that connection and and how you started thinking about this. Yeah, so uh, about half an hour south of where we live, there's a bunch of smaller towns that effectively don't exist anymore. You drive down this one highway and you see sort of the remains of a motel that was gutted. Uh, You see houses that are gone, uh, the charred sort of front lawns and that sort of thing. Uh, You also see signs all over the place saying we will rebuild and and the sort of, you know, expression of resilience that comes with that. But a lot of these places are not, we're not talking about massive cities. We're not talking about, you know, these communities that um, have a lot of resources. We're talking about much smaller places. Uh, And there's a good chance that they probably aren't going to return in any kind of sense, um, whereby you'll be able to drive past and see that nothing has happened. That particular ship has sailed. And so for the smaller towns, I think there was a sense of, 
you know, a lot of people came back and tried to rebuild and came back to their homes. A lot of people got lucky. They were evacuated, but then the fire didn't touch their particular neighborhood. Uh, but I think a lot of folks are also just going to go somewhere else because I'm not sure that a lot of these particularly really small towns have the means to recover from something like this. And increasingly, it's becoming more difficult to talk about these events, these massive wildfires as sort of one in a century fire, one in a millennium, one in a whatever, when you're having them every year. And, you know, I can't predict what this is going to look like several decades from now, but all I can see and all that is plainly evident to me is that we have no mechanism in place for if this becomes a problem involving hundreds of millions of people. We simply right. have no means to do something about it in any kind of rational way. And when we get to that place, what we end up doing as societies is resorting to bloodshed, resorting to men and women with guns and barbed wire and borders. And my only hope is that we can figure out a mechanism that doesn't force us to resort to that. So this looming crisis um, that'll happen because we don't have any protections in place right now, let's talk about that a little bit more. So where do you think most of these climate migrants or refugees will come from? Like, which parts of the world? Like everything else to do with climate change, it's almost impossible to sort of give an accurate prediction. Um, there is a significant difference in my mind between the places that are likely to see something like this and also exist in the very privileged part of the world, so mm -hmm. California's of the world, versus somewhere like Sri Lanka, where you don't have the same amount of resources. And I think one of the distinctions that needs to be made is something like, not only where is this going to happen, but what is the overlay of wealth and the overlay of, of privilege that exists in these places? You know, not that long before uh, the Arab Spring turned into a nightmare in Syria, you had a massive drought. And that was sort of the underpinning of a disaster that then kind of merged with a geopolitical uh, disaster to create something much, much worse. So in my mind, even though I think that places like Southern Louisiana are going to be hit very, very hard, and in fact already are, Southern Louisiana is losing about a football field of land uh, every hundred minutes or so. Uh, Southern Louisiana still exists within the most powerful nation in human history. There are going to be places that are going to be hit that don't have that privilege. How quickly do you think we'll start to see people being displaced en masse? I know we are seeing some of that already, but when do you think this will reach crisis levels? I genuinely have no idea. What we do know is that this is already happening, I think to the tune of about 20 million a year uh, over the past decade. And as with everything else to do with climate change, it's this notion of, well, do we have a hard timeline for this? And the answer is always no. The answer is always look, it's never going to be too late to solve this problem, much in the same way that it's never going to be too late to um, stop global warming. The difference is that if you act now, you can limit it to two degrees Celsius. If you act a decade from now, you can limit it to three degrees. So it's never going to be too late. It's just going to be the best possible outcome keeps getting worse. And I think something similar is happening with climate migration and climate refugees. I don't know that anyone would disagree that this is getting worse and that it's going to get worse. The question is, if we implement strategies to do something about this now, we can limit the amount of suffering. Whereas if we do it a decade from now, we'll still limit it. We'll just limit it to something much, much worse. So we know this is coming. We know that hundreds of millions of people stand to lose their homes because of the realities of climate change. And how prepared are we as a society for this reality? I mean, we're horribly unprepared on two fronts. Uh, the first being just the technical front. A lot of the terminology and l sort of language and norms of what we would consider sort of the, the refugee protections infrastructure is a post-war thing. And it's very much defined by the idea uh, that there are discrete, very definable uh, actions and discrete, very definable actors. So, you know, violence caused by the state, violence caused by a local gang in a local territory uh, that you can then list in your refugee application. And if it's accepted, you get certain protections. And all of that is very well defined, so long as the causes are well defined. In addition to simply not having any kind of universally accepted definition of what a climate refugee is, we also don't really have a workaround for when the violence is passive or indirect. When the violence is 
hey, the richest countries on earth have been using fossil fuels for 100 years, and as a result, the glaciers down the road from my house are melting and we're getting flooding. That's a much less definable actor-action relationship. So that's the one front that we, that we are sort of failing horribly on. The other is that we're headed in the opposite direction ideologically. Uh, ideologically, we have the rise of all of these right-wing parties that are um, opposed to any kind of movement of human beings. You know, they, they see illegal migration as effectively no different than legal migration. Uh, they certainly don't see climate refugee as a category that needs protection in any front. So you're actually headed in the opposite direction ideologically as well. Uh, and that's very scary because inevitably the end result that these folks get to is we keep him out by any means necessary. And that eventually boils down to violence. And I, and I think to me, regardless of where the numbers end up or where the trend lines take us, the one thing that terrifies me more than anything else is how often as a society, when we have a difficult problem, we retreat into violence, into state sanctioned violence as a solution, I think. Anything we can do to move away from that inevitability saves lives in the long run. Can you give me any examples of of this happening? I guess just to like put this in really in terms that people can kind of imagine and make reference to, I guess, like when you talk about the potential consequences of not having a mechanism to deal with climate refugees, you're saying that this could result in violence. And can you just give me some examples of where we've seen this happen throughout history or I guess like even in recent times? So recently I wrote this novel about that's set during the, the sort of what's commonly called the migrant crisis across the Mediterranean, which used to be front page news and is now sort of certainly the attention that it got a few years ago is now non-existent. And, and when I was doing research for this novel, one of the books I picked up that ended up heavily influencing my writing was this book called The Wandering Jews, which was written about 100 years ago. And it's a nonfiction account of uh, Jews in Eastern Europe who are fleeing horrible persecution, trying to get to Western Europe. And once they got there, uh, realizing that they then faced an entirely different kind of persecution. And one of the interesting things about that book is that the, the details, if you transpose them in time, overlap almost directly with the same kind of policies and the same kind of persecution that, that is going on in Europe today. Over 100 years, essentially almost nothing has changed. So you've seen the sort of makeshift cruelty that happens when people don't have a policy in place and don't have any kind of moral orientation to go along with it. Uh, you have in Greece, where there's multiple reports of authorities essentially taking these ships full of people who have nothing, who have effectively nothing, and turning them around and dragging them out into sea and leaving them there. That is not only on a technical level, an entirely vacant policy, a complete absence of policy. It's also on a moral level, an abhorrent thing to do. It, it is cruel and it is fundamentally evil. So what kinds of policies exist right now for climate migrants? Like what kinds of protections currently exist in Canada? And are there any other countries that are thinking about this? In the United States, the Biden administration is trying, they're, they're starting to consult on doing something about this. And of course, this is going to face incredible resistance from the Republican Party. In New Zealand, which is a fairly rich country relative to its neighbors, there was for a short while an attempt to uh, declare a climate refugee as, as a protected category uh, because a lot of the islands near New Zealand are going to disappear. And so there was a case where a person who lives on one of these islands effectively uh, went to court in New Zealand saying, I need protections this is happening to my land and it constitutes a protected category. So there's been baby steps. So we've known about the realities of climate change for decades. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been warning about climate migration since at least 1992. So why don't we have a way of processing these kinds of refugee claims yet? Because the implementation of a methodology immediately implies obligation. If anyone ever reads up on the history of the term genocide, 
for years and years and years, folks fought for an official definition. And one of the real difficulties was that the powerful nations on this planet knew that as soon as you implemented a definition and you started to, to sort of construct a framework for dealing with this, there would be an obligation to deal with it, which is why to this day, many of the most powerful nations on earth do not want to ever specify that something happening somewhere is a genocide, because as soon as you do, you have to do something about it. And I suspect something similar is happening here. As soon as you identify the term climate refugee, and you say that someone who fits a description is afforded protections, well, somebody has to afford those protections. Somebody has to offer that, that shelter. And who will it be? It'll be the richest countries on the planet. Uh, so I think that is the central hurdle here, is as soon as you do this, if in fact you do get to a situation where decades from now you've got tens, hundreds of millions of people moving, where are they going to move to? And I think as a politician in this part of the world in particular, you don't want to go down that road because you're afraid of the, the pushback you're going to get from the folks who vote for you saying, no, 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 us first. And, and you know, this, this sort of thing. That's not a good enough reason, but I think it's a central reason. Why should countries and intergovernmental agencies be thinking about creating a framework of basic protections for people who are going to be driven from their homes by climate change beyond just the moral reasons? Because I think if we don't, we end up allowing people to die in mass. That, that tends to be our sort of fallback solution to a lot of societal problems is, hey, these people that the bad thing is happening to don't have much of a voice and don't have much of a vote and don't have much of a say in how things shape. And so what is the downside of doing nothing? Uh, and effectively, that seems to be the central problem right now that there is no downside in the immediate term to doing nothing. You know, very few politicians are going to get elected in this part of the world saying, hey, I want to raise your taxes and create an entirely new legal framework so that I can let people from the other side of the planet into this country safely. Uh, also, we owe this to them because for 100 years, we've been using fossil fuels that have contributed to the demise of their homelands. That doesn't win you elections. But in the long run, like everything else to do with climate change, the best time to have done something about this is 40 years ago. Uh, that's not an option anymore. So the second best time is right now. Right. So I guess what you're saying is one of the other reasons we should be thinking about this is, is just like the basic principle of, of justice, right? Because Western countries are responsible for, for a lot of the damage that's been done already. Yeah, and then that's a difficult sell. And I get it. I get that that's a very difficult position to take because people say, hey, I wasn't alive 100 years ago. And I, what, are, what are you trying to tell me? Like, I need to heat my home. What, you're telling me that that's my fault now? And I get that. And, and part of the problem is that we have such a tendency to essentially shift all responsibility for massive societal problems at the individual level. You know, if you just recycle hard enough, or if you just take your bike to work often enough, you can solve this problem. Well, no, you can't. Please do that by all means. Uh, but what we're talking about are our system level issues. You know, the fossil fuel industry uh, contributes more to this problem in a minute than I will in several lifetimes. And so to solve those kinds of problems, you need a political solution. You need a societal solution because the magnitude of the damage those systems inflict is so much greater than anything you and I do on an individual level. So I think about the concept of climate migration and, and climate refugees a lot because I think of Bangladesh, which is where my family's from, and it's one of the places that's going to have to confront this as sea levels rise. And it's a very poor country, 170 million people live there. And and to be honest, the way that we've handled the COVID crisis and vaccine distribution and the way we've let poorer countries sort of fend for themselves while, you know, countries like Canada have hoarded the world's vaccine supply doesn't give me a lot of hope that we're going to be able to come together on this. And what do you think it'll take for people to start thinking about climate refugees in the way that you're thinking about them? My suspicion is that we will eventually do the right thing and we will eventually tackle this problem at the level and magnitude that we need to. My nightmare is what needs to happen between now and then in terms of how much suffering needs to be plainly evident before we take the steps that we already know the outline of. 
you know, it's not like people much, much smarter than me haven't been proposing solutions for years and years and years. I'm thinking of a place like Louisiana. You know, you brought up the, the, the COVID analogy, which I think is spot on. Louisiana recently had this massive, massive spike in cases. And then what you saw a little while later was a massive uptick in vaccinations. People had to see the suffering at a level of a certain threshold before they acted. So COVID is kind of a small scale example of, of how much suffering a population needs to see before they do the thing that was always available as a solution to them. And so what worries me is I have a somewhat similar relationship with home. Home for me was the Middle East, uh, a place that increasingly is becoming too hot to live in. There are parts of the Middle East that now at times no longer fit the definition of fit for human habitation because they get too hot. And you've got countries shooting drones into the sky to, to electrocute clouds in the hopes of creating rain. Those are also some of the richest countries on earth. And so how many of the incredibly poor third country laborers that built these places have to die in the heat before the folks in the air conditioned palaces down the road decide that it's time to do something about it. That to me seems to be the central question. How much suffering before we do the thing we always knew we had to do in the first place? That's it for today. I'm Tamara Kandaker. Our producers are Madeline White and Kasia Mihailovich. David Crosby edits the show. Our intern is Rebecca Weston. Angela Pachenza is our executive editor. Thank you so much to Omar el His latest book is called What Strange Paradise? If you want to email us, you can reach us at thedecibel at globamail.com. If you want to reach me, I'm on Twitter at anima underscore TK. We always want to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.